Infanticide is the killing of a born child. Whether that killing is accomplished by a direct act on the part of someone, or whether ordinary care, such as feeding, vital to the child's survival, is refused. It makes little difference whether infanticide is direct or indirect. Either way, a child is being killed. There is a strange silence on the part of the law in reference to the fact that infanticide is being practiced today, quite openly by members of the medical profession. In an effort to educate the medical profession on the art of infanticide, a documentary was produced by the Johns Hopkins Hospital and Medical School entitled, Who Should Survive? In it, a newborn infant with Down syndrome, which you may call Mongolism, was permitted to die by inattention. 
I suspect starving to death is a better way to say this. Most people have not had the experience of working with children who are being rehabilitated into society after, say, the correction of a congenital defect such as absent esophagus or short bowel. Yet some of these people tell me that such children should be allowed to die or perhaps even encouraged to die. Obviously, they say their lives could be nothing but unhappy and miserable. But I've treated hundreds of such babies and have rehabilitated them as children. And it has been my long experience that disability and unhappiness do not necessarily go together. Some of the most unhappy children I have known have had all of their mental and physical faculties. But on the other hand, some of the happiest children I have known have borne burdens that I would have found very difficult to bear. Improving medical technology, we are merely at the very beginning of what we can do to help these youngsters. The fully developed view of the medical profession grew out of the Christian consensus. This view of the medical profession is well stated by J. Engelbert Dunphy, one of the great teachers of American surgery in this generation. We cannot destroy life. We cannot regard the hydrocephalic child as a non-person and accept the responsibility for disposing of it like a sick animal. If there are those in society who think this step would be good, let them work for a totalitarian form of government where beginning with the infirm and incompetent and ending with the intellectually dissident non-persons are disposed of day and night by those in power. Some people say that no life is better than life with a severe handicap. I say that one way to find that out is to ask someone who has a severe handicap what he thinks about the quality of life that he lives. I'm sitting here in my home with these my friends who are also my patients. They all have one thing in common. None would be here today were it not for the fact that he or she had one or more serious operations followed by the most extraordinary care that the medical profession can provide. First off, you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out when you start. And now I'm like a normal functioning human being capable of doing anything anyone else can. So because um, the start was a little abnormal, it doesn't mean you're going to finish that way. And I see no reason to assume that. And I don't see how anyone can decide from the very beginning that, that you're not perfect enough to go on. That's playing God. I don't think that's fair that you should cut down somebody's life. Well, at times it got very hard, but uh, life is certainly worth living. I have a lot of good friends. From being in a hospital, I work at Children's Hospital, and I I married a wonderful guy, and I'm, I'm just so happy. 
I'm happily married. I'm very happy and uh, doing things I, I like very much, and things are going great for me. Well, well, I really appreciate being alive, <laughs> and glad I can make it. I, I really think that all my operations and all the things I had wrong with me was worth it because I really enjoy my life and I don't really let the things that are wrong with me bother me. And I like school and I have a lot of friends and I really just feel that just because people have certain things wrong with them, it doesn't really make, make, just because people have certain things wrong with them, doesn't mean that you should hold them back from living. Well, doctor, I think the quality of my life is great in spite of the few limitations I do have that were due to surgery. If anything, doctor, I think I've had an added quality to my life. Spending time in a hospital gives one an appreciation of life that I guess the quote, unquote, unhandicapped people just don't find. And uh, I love life every single minute of it. I'm married, I go to school, and I look forward to every single morning. Most of the problems were what my parents went through with the surgery. Uh, otherwise than that, I believe I've led a pretty normal life. My parents had some problems. My mother was in the hospital for a while, so I had to take over things in the house for a while. And my father was in the hospital for a while. I had to take over for a while for him. So it sort of gave me an opportunity to pay them back for what they went through when I was in the hospital. I've now been teaching high school for eight years. And it's a great joy working with the students that I have. I don't think there are limits you can put on trying to save people's lives. Or for every life you save, you learn more, too. And that makes the next life easier to save and possibly cheaper. So they spend millions and millions of dollars to send men to the moon. I think they can spend an ample amount, any amount necessary to save someone's life. Human life is so important because it's a gift. It's what makes it important also is that it's not something you can give. So you really don't have the right to take it either. I'd like to help people who have like difficulties like walking or have trouble moving their muscles. So, because I'd like to do that because I think I have good patience for that. And I know how they feel when they can't do anything and they're just locked up. And I really don't consider myself a handicap. I try not to, and I hope people don't. And most of the people I meet don't. And uh, life is just worth living. What else can I say? I feel I have the right to be alive because who is to take it upon themselves to advocate that my life isn't worth living? And I feel that every, everything should be done to help keep us alive. And even though it's easier just to do away with it, it's not the right thing to do. I feel I feel normal, and I don't feel any different. And I think a lot of people have, you know, things like I have wrong with me, you know, feel the same. Being tossed out of birth, it's a pretty heavy statement, you know. Who's gonna say this kid's no good, that kid's no good? No, no one's gonna know what I'm gonna do or what the next kid's gonna do. Uh, life is life. No one can say which life is good and which life is bad. Now, the young people that were here with me today had very, very serious problems. I'm sure they don't all look that way because their rehabilitation has been so satisfactory. But we were looking at young people who were born without a rectum, without an esophagus, with a completely defunctionalized bladder, a child with a short bowel, two children with cancer, one with lupus. And yet, these are the kind of children that many of my colleagues think have lives not worthy to be lived. I don't feel that way. Those who graduated from medical school about the same time that I did, I think came out with the idea that they were to save lives and alleviate suffering. The lives they were to save were the lives of their patients, and the suffering they were to alleviate was the suffering of their patients. This has all become strangely distorted in the semantics of the euthanasia movement. Now, if a family is suffering because of a defective child, we are to alleviate the suffering of the family by disposing of the child. So, in a strange way, you can still say
that we are saving lives and alleviating suffering. Euthanasia, abortion, and infanticide are not just questions for the immediate family, nor just for the medical profession, nor just for a few influential people. These are life and death questions for the whole human race, and they must be treated that way. Small pressure groups begin their arguments with both the legislators and the public, using extreme examples. But as soon as these are accepted, these are then expanded and they become common practice. Abortion is an example. This is no longer considered something extraordinary. It is now often accepted as a casual form of birth control. The pattern concerning infanticide is the same. At first, the argument comes from those who want to eliminate certain patients who they harshly call vegetables. But soon this is expanded to get rid of almost any unwanted child who's unwanted for almost any reason. The same is true in the discussion concerning ideals in these matters. At first we hear much talk about compassion for the unwanted. But soon this turns to a discussion of so-called rights, my rights. And then this slides into sheer economics. These life and death issues are being decided by those who are vocal enough to get the results they wish to get at the moment. Beware of these things. The discussion of life must be brought back to the place to which it belongs. Not a question of a few emotional extreme examples. Not a question uh, of selfish rights. And certainly not economics. These things must be discussed and decided upon the basis of right and wrong, not expediency. In the first episode, I pointed out that we live in a time of arbitrary sociological law. That is, the law has become just what the majority of society thinks is for their good at the given moment. Arbitrary abortion has opened the door wide for sociological medicine, not just for the yet unborn, but for the whole human race. These life and death issues are being decided upon the basis of statistics, of economics, and the so-called good of society at that given moment.
I want to introduce you to my friend Craig. He was a student of mine in Switzerland, is a graduate in philosophy at Cal State, and is now a theological student at Covenant Seminary. He was born without a left leg and without arms below the elbows. Today, in some hospitals, Craig would have been deliberately allowed to starve to death at birth. Allowing malformed babies to starve to death or removing treatment is not only a thing of the future. It is accepted now in many quarters. All that is left for the future is for this to become totally accepted and eventually, for economic reasons, mandatory by an increasingly authoritarian government in an increasingly selfish society. Many believe now that the doctor and the state should let a child die if the parents so choose. Almost everyone who talks about life not being worth living for the seriously handicapped person does so out of pure theory. Craig is in a good position to be able to tell us about the reality of life as a handicapped person. What do you think about the people who are saying today that people who are born with severe birth defects the way you were born should just be eliminated and taken out of society? I think they, they don't really understand that they're talking about people. And they, they, can only see that, they can only see the severe birth defects and the handicaps that are there, and they can't see that, that really what they're talking about is murder. Mm -hmm. I know when, when I was born, my dad, the first thing that he said to my mom after he had seen me is, that this one needs our love more. And I think that that's the reaction that we have to have, that there's an individual there who does have a handicap, but it's an individual that needs our love and needs us to help build him and help him to grow into the being that, that God has made him to be. I think that they're making a terrible mistake, that they're looking at the handicaps, the severe handicaps that these children have, instead of looking at the fact that they're human beings, that they're babies and they're destroying, or they're advocating that we destroy them before they're even given a chance to live and conquer their handicaps and to really do something uh, here while they're here on Earth. They're advocating that we eliminate something that God has given us, some, somebody that's very beautiful. Uh, I'm very glad to be alive. I live a full, meaningful life. I have many friends and many things that I want to do in life. Uh, I just <laughs> would hate for that to be taken away for a moment. I'm very thankful that, that God has given me the life that he's given me. That's wonderful. I think the secret of living with a handicap is realizing that, realizing who you are, that you're a human being, that you're somebody who is very special, and not looking at yourself always in terms of the handicap that you have, always in terms of the things that you can't do. Mm -hmm but always looking at the things that you can do and the things that you're going to do in spite of your handicap and maybe even through your handicap. Sometimes when I think about the sorrow you go through, it makes me cry. Makes me cry, makes me cry. And oftentimes I wonder why it had to fall on you. I wonder why, I wonder why, I wonder why. Long time after other people quit, you carried on. 
And when the night had fallen, your light still brightly shone, and I would love to love you. And I would love to love you. And I would love you. Though the road ahead looks rough, you know it won't be long. It won't be long. It won't be long. And though the noise is deafening, you still can hear your song. Song. Oh, my friend, I wish more people cared about you. Maybe then the world would stop from what it's coming to, and I would love. represents the tongue. The thyroid gland starts off with a little place like that and runs down into your neck. Okay, put your here and keep watching me have a girl. And we'll just see how thick your old arm is here. What do you know about that? I think that's just great. Okay? Now watch what happens to my thing. Whoops. Wow. Where did you get such a big insane? They cut you open. Yeah. Cut you open like that. The doctor. The doctor did that to you. You gonna play? You gonna play McDonald's with me? You gonna give me a hamburger? Huh? A hamburger. One little, one little hamburger. I get you everything. Okay. Fries and everything. Add a boy. Okay. How about a milkshake? Okay. Have a root beer. Good for you. Put them in here. Put them in here. Okay. Down the ubernaculum. It is truly chemoreceptors in the tunica albuginea that pick up this hyaluronidase concentration when it gets to this level. This young man I'm sending you had a sessile polyp when he was about 10, and before I turn him over to an adult gastroenterologist, I'd really like to know whether his colon is clean or not. Clean-looking colon coming get out of here all the way down to the rectum, and he's in good shape. I live by the premise that life is precious to God. 
In my role as a surgeon, I am responsible to God for the manner in which I work to save every single life. It's a matter of stewardship. I am accountable for the manner in which I use the gifts that God has given me as a surgeon. I am also responsible for the life he has entrusted to my care. But even if I were only a pragmatist, I would still take this stance. When a hospital is geared to save all lives, this attitude affects health care down to the most mundane level. But when one set of patients can be pragmatically eliminated at will, the whole spirit of struggling to save lives is lost. And it is not long before one would say, why try so hard? After all, we deliberately refuse treatment to some patients and directly kill others. Even if this were not expressed quite so blatantly, nevertheless, an unconscious erosion would take place which would inevitably undermine the care of all patients in such an institution. Of the few papers openly advocating infanticide, perhaps the most outspoken is one published in the prestigious 160-year-old New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Raymond S. Duff and Dr. A.G.M. Campbell, both of the Department of Pediatrics at Yale University School of Medicine. The title of their paper was Moral and Ethical Dilemmas in the Special Care Nursery, from which I will read a few excerpts in a moment. The authors acknowledge that 14% of the deaths in that special care nursery over a period of 18 months were related to treatment withheld deliberately. Although some, meaning the parents, have exhibited doubts that the choices were correct to let their children die, all appear to be as effective in their lives as they were before this experience. Some claim that their profoundly moving experience has provided a deeper meaning in life, and from this they have become more effective people. If these parents were seeking deeper meaning in life, why not let them find that deeper meaning by providing the love and attention necessary to care for the child who has been given to them? The deeper meaning would be deeper still. Duff and Campbell continue, it seems appropriate that the profession be held accountable for presenting fully all management options and their expected consequences. I wonder how commonly physicians are willing to be held accountable for the eventual consequences which might not be apparent in a family for years to come. Duff and Campbell say that parents are not able to give informed consent by themselves, but I say that any physician in the emotional circumstances surrounding the birth of a baby with any kind of a congenital defect, can be led by that physician by innuendo alone, let alone advice, to make the decision that the physician would like the family to make. I do not consider that informed consent. Certainly the children were not informed. Anyway, who's perfect? Where do you draw the line? Who will play God? All of these questions remain unanswered.
Isn't it ironic that so much effort is being made to keep children throughout the world from dying of hunger, while in the well-fed West, physicians are allowing infants that they deem unfit for life to starve to death? Well, how was your day today, anyway, sir? The typical day. The boss never satisfied, you know. I mean, yeah. there's very little you can do about it anymore, Bert. How's your back? Is it feeling okay? Excuse us, please. Thank you. Well, never. The least you could do was say pardon me or something, you know. Them to tea, don't you? Okay, fine. Any okay. kind's fine with me. I think I'd like to have the mint. That's always nice in the morning. It's refreshing, you know. I do need some toilet paper. Let's get the six pack, honey. It's more economical. Are you sure? Yeah. Look, you can tell by the price. Okay, okay. You're more in touch with those things than I am, but it does remind me that you've put off painting the bathroom for much, much too long now. It's got to be done. Okay. He really needs it. I, need I tell you, what? I like some soup. Okay. I really don't care for that kind, though. I'd rather have the chicken, I think. Okay. I don't think you'll eat all of it, so... No, 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 the chicken. Over here. Okay, Sorry. okay. Yeah. I have to get some spices also. Okay. That should do. Yeah, let's get this one. They should. About time. Okay. Yeah. There we go. But you know, Bert, neither one of us have that color eyes. I think we really should get something else that's more us. Don't you sure. think? Sure. Another one? Yeah, all right. <laughs> no, I think this one is good. Fine. I like the color of her hair all. Yes, that's, that's good. Okay. You notice the price? Okay, that should do it. We'll have to get some food for her, though. And I can't think of anything else that we might need. Let's go. Great. Well, we'll take some of these because it's time for me to clean the stove, you know. Okay, fine. And I'm starving, so let's get home and get on our way. Great. So hungry, I think I'm going to pass yeah. out. Not long ago, slavery was practiced in the United States. It was rooted in economics. Black men and women have been arbitrarily classified by a white society as non-human for economic convenience. In pre-Victorian America, it was economically expedient to breed as many slaves as possible. Today in the space age, it is economically expedient to abort unwanted fetuses and eliminate imperfect babies. Apparently, in every age, there's always someone branded as subhuman. It once was the black, later the Jew. Today, it is the unborn and the child. 
The Supreme Court of the United States in the Dred Scott decision upheld the fiction with a ruling declaring the black person to be chattel property. One will note that historically, the Supreme Court has been wrong more than once. There were many churches during the Civil War era that either passively accepted the enslavement of their fellow human beings or even justified it. Those short-sighted churches have their counterparts today. There are certain segments of the church which are in favor of infanticide. A task force of the Anglican Church in Canada came to the conclusion in August of 1977 that it could be morally right to terminate the life of a newborn infant born with serious brain damage. The callousness of the report is shown by the phraseology. They said, our senses and emotions lead us to the grave mistake of treating human looking shapes as if they were human, although they lack the least vestige of human behavior and intellect. In fact, the only way to treat such defective infants humanly is not to treat them as human. The task force was made up of those coming from the backgrounds of theology, medicine, nursing, and law. That people from these backgrounds could give such a report is astounding. This is humanism bringing forth inhumanity. The language of these people should remind us of the language and the sentiments of those in the past who defended slavery and who too tried to prove uh, that the black man uh, was not human. The fact that these people can use the church as their vehicle is especially alarming. Those who propagate such theories and uh, those even who just don't bother to think about them have an ample warning from history if they would only listen to history. Doctors and nurses should know from the past how fallible such decisions are and how destructive pop science theories are about human worth. The lawyers should be utterly appalled at beginning to let down the bars on killing any human being on the basis of the quality of life. And finally, these theologians have obviously forgotten God's view of the worth of every human being as made in the image of God. If these same theologians no longer believe in such a God, they should not hide in the respectable womb of the church, using it as a platform to propagate their discriminatory ideas. If the church wants to be remembered as more than a silent accomplice to these murderous inhumanities, it had better stand up and be counted. The same is true of those in the secular world who believe in the preciousness of each human life. How long can we remain silent? At present, those who actively foster infanticide are growing in numbers and influence. Their views, being hammered at us again and again, are taken a little more seriously each time and becoming a little more thinkable each time. Link this with genetic engineering the growing power of government and arbitrary law <clears throat> and the prospects for the rights of the individual and for humanity are grim. Without the Judeo-Christian basis, which gives an intrinsic dignity to the individual as made in the image of the infinite personal creator, each successive monstrosity slides naturally into place.
Here we come to the next logical step of the giving away of the biblical perspective of the uniqueness of mankind in that men, women, and children are made in the image of God. Humanness is lost step by step. The door is open for abortion on demand to a fantasize, which leads naturally to euthanasia, the killing of the unwanted elderly. This final step of the carrying out of this low view of human life may be closer than we think.